In the last post, we heard Dr. Akoff explain what a system is in a general way. In this post, we're going to look at how that concept translates to systems of care for high-risk, time-sensitive emergencies. Dr. Akoff's example of a system was an automobile. Having all the best parts of cars does not mean you have the best car. It won't even start. The reason is that all of these best parts do not fit together. In a system of care, the same principle applies. The performance of a system of care is not determined by the sum of the behavior of its parts. It's a product of their interactions. Let's consider this in context of out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. Consider a theoretical community where they have an amazing level of bystander performance in recognizing a cardiac arrest more than anywhere else. That same community also has an extremely high percentage of the population that also knows how to perform hands-only CPR more than anywhere else. They have AEDs all over town, more of them per capita than anywhere else. They have a 911 communication center with the best technology and staff, as good or better than anywhere else. They have a fire rescue department that has all the best equipment and an absolutely top-notch staff. They do a great job of caring for patients prior to ambulance transport, and they're the very, very best at that. This community has an ambulance service with the very best ambulances, equipment, and staff. The crews do the very best in assessment and treatment of patients that are in their ambulances. The community has an emergency department with all the best equipment, facilities, and staff. The care they provide to patients while in their ED is the very best. The cardiac cath lab has all the latest equipment, a phenomenal staff, and amazing interventionalists. Now, consider an out-of-hospital cardiac arrest in that community if all of those best parts do not fit together well. Person's walking down Main Street and they collapse. The part of the system for training bystanders to quickly recognize cardiac arrest, start CPR, call 911, all of that works excellent. The call is made to the 911 communication center and the dispatcher helps with coaching CPR on scene. However, the dispatch part of the system is not connected very well to the part of the system for bystander AEDs. There's a nearby AED, but the locations of the AEDs are not available to the dispatcher, so the opportunity for a very early defibrillation on this patient is missed. There are also connection problems within the 911 communication center with recurring problems in how calls are assigned to fire rescue agencies. Unfortunately, it's the jurisdictional boundary, not the closest available fire rescue unit, that determines which unit gets the call. And there's also similar issues with ambulance assignments. This often results in delays of arrival of EMS units at the scene. But eventually, the fire rescue unit does arrive on scene. They do excellent CPR, apply a state-of-the-art automated CPR device with virtually no interruption of chest compressions. They also apply the defibrillation pads of a state-of-the-art monitor defibrillator. The ambulance crew arrives. Unfortunately, the crews from fire rescue agency and the ambulance service do not get along well with each other. There's a lot of institutional ego and takeover politics going on in the background. They do not train together, and these issues manifest as diminished teamwork on the scene. At this point, the patient is going in and out of arrest, so they need to keep the defibrillator patches and automated CPR device available in case they're needed during transport. The rescue agency and ambulance service use different monitor defibrillators, and the patches are not cross-compatible. The automated CPR device used by the fire rescue agency is not the same one used by the ambulance crew. They each have the best equipment, and when working separately, do a great job. But when they have to work together, things do not go smoothly. Eventually, the CPR equipment and defibrillator monitors are switched out to get the equipment from the ambulance service in place. The patient is placed into the ambulance. While en route, they get a sustained return of pulses. They quickly get a 12 lead. It clearly shows a STEMI. But the ambulance crews and the ED staff do not have a smooth working relationship either. They gave a report to the ED while en route, but they did not give it much priority. And hence, the report was not given until they were just around the corner, even though there was plenty of opportunity to give an early notification during their 14-minute transport 
without compromising patient care. As a result, the ED had no time to prepare. They did not have time to get a code room bed open in the ED, so the crew and the ED staff did their best in a different room. The ED assessed the patient, they got another 12 lead, drew blood to check cardiac enzymes. Everything indicated a STEMI, but the cardiology department does not trust the ED or EMS to activate the cath lab. The interventional cardiologist eventually comes in to examine the patient, the patient is taken to the cath lab and a stent is placed. Those recurring episodes of ventricular fibrillation that were happening before have stopped and the patient survives, but with a bit of a neurological deficit. Discharge orders for medications, specialty and primary care follow-up, and cardiac and neuro rehab were all ordered, but there was poor compliance. This patient was cared for in a community with the best individual parts but they do not all fit together very well. The outcomes for this patient and many others is not nearly as good as they could be. The difference between the top and lower performing systems of care is primarily a result of how they make the pieces fit together, not how well each of the pieces work individually. How well those pieces fit together is often a function of policies, politics, and communications. Great equipment can help. Great training can help. Great technology can help. But all the pieces have to fit together well. We all need to think about these challenges from a systems perspective and not just how to make our individual stovepipes better. What if we have the best parts and make them all fit together extremely well? Is that the ultimate? Maybe or maybe not. Let's take a look at that in the next post.